Good evening. To, whoa, whoa. Uh, good evening to you all. Thank you for coming this evening. I'd like to call the Monday, July 25th, 2016, regular meeting of the Falls Church City Council to order and ask you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Conley. <clears throat> Here. Mr. Duncan. Here. Ms. Hardy. Here. Ms. Oliver. Here. Mr. Snyder. Is uh, on work travel, but he should be coming later. Okay. Uh, Mr. Z is not here. And Mayor Tarter. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looks like we've got some more speakers. Um, do we have a motion relating to the meeting agenda? Why, yes. I move to adopt the meeting agenda. Thank you very much. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Are there any proclamations or special presentations, Madam Clerk? No, sir. Okay. Any oaths of office to administer to new board and commission members? I don't see anybody here. Okay. Why don't we move on to our comments? Do we have any written comments? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, we had several, several on the library referendum. Uh, Mary Virginia Smith and John R. Johnson of 1205B Lincoln Avenue wrote in favor of placing the library referendum on the ballot. Right. Christ Christina Goodwin, 615 Knollwood Avenue, wrote in opposition to placing the library referendum on the ballot. She suggested providing necessary repairs and maintenance to the existing building and waiting to consider further renovations after the campus development project is sorted out. Vipis wrote in support of the proposed library renovation and expansion projects and in support of placing the library referendum on the ballot. And Michael R. Volt, 314 West Columbia Avenue, wrote in favor of placing the library referendum on the ballot. We had a letter about City Hall. Tina Earman of 226 Nolan Street wrote to express her concern about the state of City Hall after touring the facility on July 23rd. She expressed uh, particular concern about public safety improvements that are needed to uh, maintain security. And um, in other letters, uh, Sandra Bolivar, 100 West Annandale Road, wrote several times to express frustration with the 3T bus being cut. Jeff Heil of 307 Grove Avenue expressed that the WOND trail is not just a bike trail, it is used by pedestrians too. Uh, the Fairfax County Planning and Zoning Department forwarded comments about the proposed comprehensive plan amendment that would create revitalization areas. And Carol Luton forwarded information about concerts across America to end gun violence. Thank you very much. So now we're gonna move on to the receipt of public comment. If anyone in the audience wishes to speak, as many of you do, please fill out one of these pink slips and hand them to the clerk and she will hand them to me and then you'll be given three minutes to speak. If you could state your name and address for the record and keep your comments to three minutes, we would greatly appreciate it. If you decide you don't wanna speak at the beginning of the meeting, meeting, you're also welcome to speak when the item that you're here to speak about is called, such as the library. So if you wanna speak um, about the library, you can speak now and you can leave, or you can uh, speak now and hang out, or you can speak later when the item's called. So I'm gonna go through the list of names here and, uh, and you can let me know what you wanna do. Our first speaker is Caitlin Williams. Caitlin, welcome. Hi, would you like to speak now? So good to see you. Thank you for coming out. Okay. All right, go ahead. My name's Kate Williams. Hi. Clearly. I live in 406 West of Norway. Don't you say a word, huh? Why is that on the leave? Okay. I like to live in the library. No, <laughs> she would like to live in the library. <laughs> what, what does it say? I love the library. Good job. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Go on. Say. Come on. I work at the library. Yes, but go I on. go there every week. Okay. Voila. Go on. Please help the library. Get tax money. What kind of tax money? New tax money. 
Okay. Wow. All right. All right. Fantastic. Thank Caitlin, you. if you'd like, we've got a pin. Would you like a pin, a Falls Church City pin? We're happy to give that to you. You can either come up or we can come down and see you. Thank you so much for those, uh, those kind words about the library. I know you love the library like a lot of us do. So it's good to hear from you. <laughs> I understand you also volunteer at the library. That's fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. Good. Whoops. So good to see you. Thanks for coming out. Here's a pin for you. You can wear it if you'd like. Yeah, if you want to get up, if you guys want to get up. <laughs> Not yet. All right. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was great. Okay. Our next speaker is Alex Verutzis. Alex, come on up. You're next. Lost in thought, followed by Joanna Berry. It looks like I have a lot of paper here. It's just all mixed up. <laughs> I haven't had really time to sort through everything. I want to thank the City of Falls Church um, for getting the word out there about the flood victims in um, West Virginia and letting us up, set up uh, donation boxes at the Recreation Center. A couple people I'd really like to thank are Mrs. Dolan uh, in the Grove Avenue neighborhood. She made a cash donation that allowed us to buy things like denture cream, denture cleaner, uh, things of that nature. I'd also like to thank David Snyder for a very, very, very generous donation of several gift cards. Uh, when we gave the people at White Sulphur Springs those, those gift cards, they were, they were almost in tears. Thank you, David. Um, we've made three trips so far. The first two trips consisted of well over 4,000 items. Those were donated from the people of Falls Church to my motorcycle clubs my wife belongs to, um, Lady Riders and Southern Cruisers. Also, the George Mason class of 76 uh, that my wife was from, they donated a lot of items as well. Um, the Sheriff's Department donated over 900 items, and I'll, at some point I'm going to give a breakdown, complete breakdown to uh, the City Council. Um, Barbara Cram was a big help in uh, organizing a lot of the collection effort. I couldn't have done this without her. Uh, she brought together the City of Falls Church Ellison on Ellison Street, Jefferson Street neighborhoods, Fall, um, Church of Jesus Christ of Later Day Saints, Great Falls Street, Englewood Street, Arlington, Scotts Rung Chapel in McLean, and several other churches that I have to still list. Right now, we're, we're slowing down our collection effort. They're in a rebuild mode. So we're taking down um, things like sheets, um, uh, still some clothing such as clean un or new underwear, new socks, uh, towels, uh, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me one moment. A brief list, we collected over 460 protein protein drinks, um, 66 Boost, Ensure were 188, Lucerna 198, PD Light 53, um, PD Light powdered six boxes. I didn't realize how expensive that stuff was until I went to BJ's. I, I was really happy to see that. 94 pairs of women's socks, 162 pairs of women's underwear, Men's briefs, uh, 107, boxers, 11, men's socks, 134 pairs, men's t-shirts, 22, girls' socks, 42, girls' underwear, 37, boys' socks, 45, boys' underwear, 99. That was a total of um, 2,208 units. And with the Sheriff's Department that also put out boxes, uh, we collected another 928 units from them, so we delivered 
on our third trip, well over 3,100 units. We're going to be taking another full truckload down tomorrow, and then our focus is going to be pretty much on musical instruments for uh, one of the high schools um, that they lost their, their band lost their entire uh, music department. So if anybody has any musical instruments, please contact us or drop them off at the rec center. And I'll put this in a clearer statement so you all have all the details. Thank you. Thank you. I tell you, it's been an extraordinary effort. And uh, I think our, uh, uh, we certainly appreciate the fine work you've done and Barb and all the others, but uh, extraordinary uh, work you all have done. So thank you very much on behalf of our community and theirs. Mr. Mayor, if I might, I, I think in the future we ought to recognize this extraordinary team effort with the quarterback being Alex, who really, it, it's a classic example of one person can make a difference. And a lot of folks talk negatively about America these days, but we're still a country where one person can make a huge difference in a lot of lives. So Alex, thank you very much. Simply awesome, as well as everyone, Sheriff's Department, Barb Cram, the churches, everyone who contributed. I think we ought to find a way to recognize that effort. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to add for the record, the Pew family, P-U-G-H family, uh, was involved in sponsoring the fundraiser at Clarendon's recently for the high school that lost its band instruments, uh, drew a great crowd, uh, a lot of folks there, and uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. Andrew Acosta was the entertainment, and uh, they were selling West Virginia Trong Strong t-shirts, which I was pleased to buy one to add to my Mountaineer t-shirt collection from when my son went to WVU. At any rate, that was a, a great uh, community event. Uh, there were some uh, Facebook uh, postings about it. I just wanted to acknowledge the Pew's family, uh, the Pew family's role in uh, getting that started. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Our next speaker is Joanna Berry, followed by Jeff Peterson. Ms. Berry, welcome. Council, um, Johanna Berry, 111 East Jefferson Street. Um, tonight you have before you TO 16-12, which requests that the City Council adopt an ordinance to authorize the issuance of bonds, approve a bond referendum for this coming November 4th for a public library referendum, uh, re sorry, renovation and expansion, and request the court to order such referendum. This should be one of the easiest decisions this council will make and I urge you to move forward with these authorizations. The Mary Riley Stiles Library is not only a treasure in the heart of our city, a meeting place, a place of knowledge, and dare I say, a place of contemplation, and a world-class resource for all of our citizens, and I emphasize all of our citizens. It is also a very important part of our interjurisdictional web of services. We attract readership and membership from all over Northern Virginia. I don't dismiss that there will be a financial implication, approximately one point cents on the tax dollar. I am as loath to advocate a raise in the tax rate as anyone, but the significant difference between the impact of the library renovation as opposed to other major capital expenses that the council is going to consider is that the benefits associated with this expenditure are immediate. The library will remain open, all residents will be able to use this resource, and current and future residents will benefit equally from this important investment. I'm thanking you in advance for your support of this measure, and of course, thanking you for your service. Thank you um, for that, and thank you for your service. Uh, Jeff Peterson, followed by Mr. DeLong. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Jeff Peterson, 205 Tyson Drive. I've served uh, over 10 years on the library board, and I'm here to urge you to endorse the resolution to take the library project to a referendum. I first want to uh, say a word of thank you to the library staff, especially Library Director Mary McMahon, for all their hard work in developing the master plan that this project is based on. Uh, also to the city staff and the planning commission for their guidance in helping us refine and improve these plans. 
So why is this project needed? Really, uh, I think three reasons. First, it's needed badly. It's affordable. And finally, it's timely. On the topic of needed, so the demand for services at the library, the collection, the children's room, local history, meeting space, uh, these are all exceeding, the rate of demand for these services is exceeding the rate of the City of Falls Church population growth. It is not possible to meet the growing demand for these services without more space. In addition, renovation to the existing space is long overdue. Partly that's because we put off renovations given the hope that we would have a larger project to wrap them into. Elevators, bathrooms, HVAC, lighting all desperately need attention. So on the second point, affordable, the project meets critical space and renovation needs at the lowest possible cost. You all have heard the additional information about other ideas about the library. Clearly more space would be ideal, but I urge you to consider that, uh, that we not make a perfect project the enemy of a very good project. Finally, on timely, um, these library needs cannot wait five or 10 more years. The project's ready to go now. Uh, bond costs are at an historic low. And 10 years from now, we'll spend more to get much less. So for all those reasons, I urge you to vote to send this important project to public referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your service on the uh, library board. Mr. DeLong, followed by Mr. Kalin. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Chester W. DeLong. 213 West Columbia Street, Falls Church. You've heard me before on this subject. You've read my comments in the newspaper. Uh, you've heard the library board's recommendations to you, the planning commission's recommendations to you. I won't go into all of that. What I want to urge to you is that it, this is an urgent, for the library, an urgent problem that we have in our hands. We would like you to address that urgency, and we would like you to do that by sending this proposal to the public for a referendum. In any case, if the referendum wins, you win. If the referendum loses, you win. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kalin? OK. Uh, then our last speaker at this point is Mr. Camp, Donald Camp. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Donald Camp. I live at uh, 134 North Fairfax Street. And um, I am a member of the library board. I'm speaking today as a citizen of the city of Falls Church. Um, you've heard and you know the need for the renovation of the library and expansion. Uh, we have a well-researched uh, proposal on the table. This has been studied for upwards of 10 years. It's been in the capital budget for a number of years. Uh, my request to the council is give the citizens of the city a chance to vote on the proposal. Uh, please put the referendum on the, budget, on the uh, ballot this November. Please do not delay it another year. We cannot afford delay, and frankly, it's, it's time to let the citizens have their chance to vote yay or nay on this uh, referendum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that is our last speaker who has filled out a slip at this time. Mr. Kalin, of course, uh, you'll be speaking later. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak now? If not, we'll move on then. Uh, let's go on to council requests. Are there any council requests this time? Okay. Uh, why don't we go on to the report of the city manager. Uh, Mr. Shields is on vacation, a well-deserved vacation, and we are lucky to have uh, Cindy Mester with us tonight. Thank you very much for stepping into his shoes. We appreciate it. Certainly. Glad to do so and have just a few announcements, uh, things to report out to council this evening. Um, one is a follow-up to um, our actions of what we're doing in terms of the excessive heat to make sure that we're keeping our staff, our citizens, and 
participants and programs safe. We have been messaging the use of the community center and the library as cooling centers so folks can go there during the hot weather. Um, and also Fairfax County, through our partnership and our interjurisdictional agreements, has two programs that city residents may be eligible, some are income-based, and that is their cooling assistance program that can help with bill payments and AC repairs if they break down during this excessive use, and also a fan care program where free fans or window units can be provided. All of that information is available on the city's homepage, so citizens have one place to go get that additional information. Additionally, while we're doing an excessive amount of summer camps this year, which are mostly outside, a lot of them are sports and other activities, today we brought most of those inside, and those that went out were short-term under the pavilion in the shade and back into hydrate. So we're being very sensitive to that as well as for our staff that are out in the field, whether they're public works, police, to make our de development services inspectors to make sure that we're limiting the time out, they stay hydrated, and also that we're minimizing uh, vehicles and emissions during this hot period. So I wanted just to give council and the community uh, an update on that. Also, Housing and Human Services released uh, an affordable housing survey today, so that's been put on the website and a lot of social media put out regarding that, and they are looking to get some good information on people's perspectives on affordable housing, rental, um, mortgages, and that will close on August 7th, and then that research will help roll into the housing chapter update that uh, housing services and development services doing as part of the comp plan. So that's August 7th, and that information is also on the website. Um, as council knows, Harris Teeter is doing their grand opening this Wednesday at 8 a.m., so um, council's been invited to do that and then to join in that celebration, and the store will be immediately open thereafter for shopping. So we're looking forward to that construction project uh, coming to fruition and opening up. Uh, two more concerts in the parks are scheduled for this summer. This week is Mama Tried and Randy Barrett, and then August 4th will be Tom Principato. So we can have bluegrass this week and blues rock the following week. And then a short uh, respite, and we'll be doing sunset cinemas. And so those, that information is on the website for what movies. And at the concerts, people can still vote for what they want the the viewers' choice movies to be. So we're looking forward to seeing the outcome of those ballots. And the final thing that I would just note is that this past Saturday, uh, we conducted city hall tours so folks could see the existing conditions in terms of public safety, uh, general citizen access, public safety, security through the building, and ADA OSHA compliance. And we were pleased with the turnout. Um, for our first time to do that, we had some people that are generally familiar with this building, but maybe not so much about the project. And then we had some folks that uh, didn't know anything about it, but heard about the announcements and came and checked it out. Um, so we definitely had some good information exchange, and we'll be folding that into our uh, full community engagement report back to council in the fall. And I thank Mr. Duncan for joining in on one of those tours so that I um, got a first-hand experience as a task force member what um, the community was commenting about in terms of this. And I also appreciated that uh, Chief Gavin joined me for the entire morning knowing that they are currently in the midst of their accreditation, which started yesterday afternoon, was a full day today, and will continue tomorrow. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions the council has. Vice Mayor Connolly. Ms. Mester, regarding the heat, if someone needs transportation to a cooling center, what's the best way to help them with that? Uh, that would be probably a direct call into Housing and Human Services so we can coordinate that. And I failed to mention the Winter Hill um, with their generator has a, also opened up and are available. And so that can help those folks in the Winter Hill, um, either senior or general community. But through HHS, we'd be able to help coordinate transportation if it's okay. needed. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, I've got one or two that I might ask. One, um, I'm, I know you're still working on a 3T bus uh, situation, and I, I guess I would just ask that you keep us updated. I know there's, with the heat particularly, there's a lot of folks 
and we've heard from some of them are very interested in keeping that moving along, I think, as, as we as a council are as well. So if you'll keep us updated and keep the pressure on, I think we'd all appreciate it. Certainly, and that has been uh, as requested for the fall public hearing and the comments that we are getting directly to council on forwarding to Amada so they're aware of the citizen comments around heat and fumes and so forth. Great. Um, also, I just saw in my packet here, I wasn't aware of this, but uh, it looks like Falls Church has been named one of Virginia's 20 safest communities by SafeWise. So I'm just going to read a, a small snippet of this. Snippet of this. Um, and this is a letter from Mark Warner, Senator Mark Warner. Um, I'm pleased to extend my warmest congratulations to the city of Falls Church upon being named one of Virginia's 20 safest communities by SafeWise. This honor recognizes the community's efforts that have resulted in the safety of your residents and visitors. In order to achieve this milestone, the police department, sheriff's office, local government, and greater community work together towards a shared goal of, safe, of a safer city. So anyway, our congratulations particularly, we've got our chief here. I, uh, I don't know if you were aware of this award, uh, the first you heard of it as well, but uh, congratulations to you and to our, our sheriff's office and the rest of our public safety folks on allowing Falls Church to receive this, so congratulations. Is there any other questions or comments, or should we move on to the first item of business on the agenda? Uh, we have not talked about the bike share, but I'm happy to uh, entertain comments about that. At our last meeting, we were talking about efforts to get bike share, and there has been some action since then. So can you just give us a quick update on that? Be glad to. At the November, the November felt like it was going for a whole year till November, July 14th MVTA meeting, uh, they did approve $2 million for the bike share. This is not through the 70% uh, MVTA funding allocation, but rather through RSTP, and it was through a partnership with Fairfax County to be advanced the money so we can proceed. Um, so staff is currently working with um, MVTA for the formal agreement and then also starting the procurement process. Um, it looks like we will write a contract with Alexandria that has been set up through federal requirements, which will be important because this source of funding is federal, which is a change from the original plan. But the good news is $2 million for MVTA capital. And July 28th, the Commonwealth Transportation Board should approve the MVTC recommendation of our operating money. So. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Thank Good you. News. Thank you for your work on that. That was a big effort by a lot of people, and I really appreciate that that has happened. Yeah, I think that's tremendous for the city. I really do. It's just a, a great way to tie in the metros and to tie people around our city uh, outside of driving cars. I know a lot of folks, as um, the vice mayor just mentioned, uh, were involved in this effort, and uh, we really, I think you did a great job. So thank you all. Uh, Ms. Hardy? On the topic of bike share, I just wanted to say thank you to the community members. I believe Ms. Messer had told me that bike share in Falls Church was one of the items that had one of the most public comments on it. And so I think a good number of people either wrote in or sent in letters. And so we really appreciate the community support for it, too. Uh, quick question. Do you have a rough timeline now that we have hopefully the funds secured on both operating and capital when citizens might actually see bike share installed? Um, we are hoping that they will be by the spring of 2017. We have to go through some extensive procurement and then in, any right of way or easement acquisition. But hey, let me ask you: Do we have to roll it all out at one time, or can we roll out, let's say, eight stations and then do the eight three months later when additional things are taken care of? Yeah, we can roll it out in phased, and that's our intention. Which it's also good because the operating money can be phased over five years. So as we ramp up. So we'll go for hopefully some easy ones first, such as uh, City Hall, where we already own the land and right of way is pretty easy to get to. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely start that. We do need to do initially a good overall study of exactly where we're going to put them to make sure that they're spaced properly within you know enough close distance that it makes usable sense to do it because you want to check it out for 30 minutes, have another station to put it back in, do your stuff, and get the bike back out. So we're going to do that first and then concurrently order the equipment and then we'll be able to install, but we will install in phase, not all at once. And how about Fairfax County with the West Falls Church Metro uh, station? What's uh, our coordination with them? Um, after the MVTA meeting, we actually had a preliminary conversation with the uh, Transportation Director of Fairfax County again to reactivate that dialogue. So, 
He's currently on vacation, but in a week we will pick that back up. So. Arlington had already been proceeding quite nicely because they already had bike share, and so that was an easy one to uh, facilitate. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Mayor, could I just ask about the Thursday uh, meeting of the Fairfax Planning Commission when I understand they're supposed to vote on the Mount Daniel application? Do we know uh, what time that vote is likely to occur, or is there some plan for letting those of us who are in town that night know what has happened that evening? I do not know the specific time that this agenda item will come up on Thursday, so I can I locate that information for you and certainly um, follow up with the superintendent so I could report out to you all on the vote. Okay. Vice Mayor Connolly. At last week's planning commission meeting, they don't set, they have everything that's on the agenda, but they don't set the time until you actually show up and start meeting. So no one knew the order of the items until the meeting began. So. I think you probably can watch it on um, some kind of streaming TV. I'll just know that's, you know, there's a concert in the park that night. There's a big event at the State Theater that night. There's a lot going on in town that is going to take people away from wanting to go out and watch firsthand. So I was just hoping that we might get a, you know, email, tweet, something that would let us know what happened. Well, maybe Vice Mayor Connolly, who was at the hearing, um, we'll be able to do that if she's back. So she email uh, me. I'll keep an eye out for you. But it was quite well attended, um, uh, and there was a lot of uh, community support there. A lot of citizens, uh, school board members, city council members. So uh, it was quite well attended, I think. And and I think Falls Church put their best foot forward. So we'll see how it turns out. Anything else uh, before we move on? All right, Madam Clerk, will you call the first item, please? Yes, the first item is TO 16-12 ordinance authorizing the issuance of general obligation bonds of the City of Falls Church, Virginia in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $8,700,000 to pay costs incident to renovating, constructing, expanding, reconstructing, replacing in one or more locations, equipping and or re-equipping in whole or in part a public library including an archive heritage center and requesting the circuit court to order a special referendum election on the question of whether the issuance of such bonds should be authorized. Okay, thank you. Ms. Messner. Yes, let me give a start and then I'll ask uh, Ms. Koskri to add a few comments. Um, this item is before council for second reading. Uh, we had a full presentation at first reading, so we have not planned to do that again. But uh, Ms. McMahon, library director, is present and able to answer a question that council has. The item before you is responsive to the comments that were made at the and request by council at the first reading. There were some changes that didn't get captured and I'm gonna ask Carol to speak to them, but I will call your attention that you have a revised document before you at the dais and that is the one that uh, staff would be asking you to vote on this evening and the recommendation is to approve um, the ordinance to proceed with issuing of the bonds and placing this on the November uh, referendum vote. Briefly, the language um, in one or more locations, which was to modify replacing, did not get put into the document that was initially posted on Granicus and initially distributed to you. So we've added that. The document was posted today um, on Granicus and that language has been inserted. Um, for the benefit of the public, I'll just go through the line numbers and the report. Um, the words in one or more locations follow the word replacing. It occurs in line 114, line 133, line 163, and line 171. That the item was advertised with that language included, therefore it's appropriate for you to adopt it with that modification. But we have, um, that just slipped out in the process of preparing the report. Thank you very much, but that notice is valid for all purposes? Yes, it is, because the notice had that language included. Okay, thank you. Um, is, there, is that it for then the staff presentation? Yes, Mayor, and we're available for any questions. Okay. Um, 
I know we have a public speaker. We'll get to you in just a second, Mr. Kalen. So are there any questions for staff? Vice Mayor Connolly? My question is, if this referendum is placed on the ballot, is there any cost to the city to do that? Or is it a minimal cost that would, because we're having an election already, just by adding an additional ballot question, are we adding any extra expense? There's no significant increase to the actual voting process. Um, it, this, the programming of one additional question to the ballot is not significant. And as you noted, we would already be having an election. So all the wards and um, polls would be set up. Okay, thank you. Are there other, uh, Mr. Duncan? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, alteration to the language. I wondered when I first read the packet if I had imagined that we'd talked about that and, and I'm pleased to see that it is included. Um, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, Ms. McCoskey, so uh, stop me when I need to be stopped. You had uh, sent us a memorandum regarding uh, the communication uh, between the city and the Stiles family and had asked uh, members of council whether uh, uh, whether we thought it was okay for you to communicate with the family. Just asking, I want to thank you for that note first and second ask you what was the disposition of your poll of council in regards to whether we would uh, open up a line of communication between the city and the Stiles family. I've heard from a few members of council who have advised me that they um, support me going forward with a plan and I've heard that no one objects to that. So it's my intention to move forward and contact the family, let them know what's going on now and um, see if we can potentially uh, maybe agree on any amendments to the covenants in the deed that will give us more flexibility in the future. Thank you very much. Ms. Hardy? I believe I asked this in June, but I wanted to reconfirm for the public's benefit. Um, while the language in the uh, ordinance specifies that we are authorizing the issuance of bonds, that if we pass this ordinance tonight and if the public um, passes the referendum, this does not actually issue any bonds. It requires another action by council. Is that correct? It is the practice that there be another action by council before we actually issue the bonds. I am not sure that that would be legally required, but that's how it's always been done, and that's what the expectation would be, that we would come to you before we actually um, issue the bonds to, um, for another action. Mr. Snyder? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, clearly very supportive of this. question I had is that the title of our ordinance mentions an archive heritage center, and yet there's no mention of an archive heritage center in the bond question or in the, the title bef right before the bond question. Um, is that an oversight? Because if, if I recall, the action was to include both of those. We Yes, I, I, I have believed that essentially that's included anyway, but it may be prudent for us to add that back in, add those words back in to the bond question to make it clear. It really was, it came out as an oversight, and I think we didn't worry about it as much because it had a, um, because I think that's part of a library, but we may want to add it back in. And if you would like, I can give you the location where those words should be added. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So I think um, we would add the words, including an archive heritage center after the words, a public library, wherever it's included. And that would be in line 115, line 134, line 164 and lines 171 continuing on 172. So that's four locations. And the words would come after library, before the comma, and they would be 
including an archive heritage center. Thank you. Um, we had a very thorough discussion on this on the public record. Does the addition of this language in any way make our action tonight infirm? It does not. That language was also, the advertisement is the language in the title, which already includes that language, so it does not. All of this language was included in the advertisement. Okay, thank you very much. Vice Mayor Connolly. Ms. McCroskey, did you mention line 136? I believe I included, no, actually, line 136 is not a place. It's true, public library does appear there, but that's not the listing of the things we're going to do, so we would not need to amend that section. Okay. It's, it's the two lines before at 134. Are there any more questions of staff before I open it up to the public for public comment? Okay. Vice uh, My other question just regarding the, if it does pass, the responsibility of sharing the information with the public about the need for a new library renovation falls on the library board. And who, else, who would be the city person who's leading that? I, I don't know if the manager wants to say that the... The staff and the library director will be responsible for making sure that we have the facts put out as we would for any other um, bond action and then would defer to the patrons and the library board of trustees if they wanted to do more proactive advocacy beyond putting out the facts on the website, fact sheets. Um, I know council has asked the um, communications office to work with the library director to do a similar snapshot like we did for City Hall, we'll do something similar for the library, which is a good fact sheet. And if there was a community group that wanted to lend their support to that, they could do that as well. That, that would be correct. It's just council and staff that cannot. And public funds can't be used for that purpose, so the community group would have to do that independently. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's go ahead and open this up to the public. Our first speaker, maybe only speaker, is Mr. Ira Kalin. And if there's anyone else while he's coming forward who would like to speak to this matter, please uh, fill out one of the pink speaker slips and hand it to the clerk. And you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, Mr. Kalin, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ira Kalin, 429 Park Avenue. Given the strongly held view that the citizens of Falls Church should have an opportunity to participate in the city's decision making, it is clear that the city council should authorize a referendum which will provide every voting resident the opportunity to be heard on this important matter. Now I'm going to move to some of the financial issues which are more general than this and would be for when it goes out to the public. It also appears that the funding of the library and the disposition of the Mount Daniel project have become intertwined. It should not be and will be a serious error to so do. If Fairfax approves the Mount Daniel project, the issue goes away. If they do not agree, an alternative will need to be found. At, that moment, at the moment, there does not appear to be a publicly available plan B. As such, it would likely take a couple of years to design and execute a plan B. The library, which is ready to move forward and other city capital needs, should not be held hostage to Mount Daniel or other school capital projects. More, third point. Moreover, if all the capital spending associated with the library, city hall improvements, and other identified city capital needs were delayed or canceled, it would not make a dent to the challenges of funding a $112 million high school. For the city chart shows that the library tax rate impact would be about 1.8 cents. To look at well, the op most optimistic cost estimate for the schools was 5 cents on the tax rate. <clears throat> to look at it another way, the library, which represents one 14th the cost of the high school 
would generate a tax rate over a third of that generated by the high school. This doesn't make any sense under any circumstances. Also, in that five cent scenario, it, there is an assumption that the remaining six million of water sale proceeds would be used for the new high school. Maybe you can answer this. Why didn't the city manager apply the six million dollars to the library, which would then have reduced the cost to two million dollars and would have had a negligible tax rate implication? The cost comparison of, with the schools is so flawed that it should be removed or redone so that the comparison is not clearly biased against the library and city capital needs. And now finally, I'd like to understand better if, if even if it's been done before, what is this in one or more locations about? We've had a pretty tough discussion about this. Are we thinking about having a second location? Are we thinking about moving the library? Are we thinking about tearing down? Remember, I have emails about some members of council thinking of tearing down the library and building a multi, uh, a mixed use development in that lot. What is the flexibility that we are asking for and what does this mean for the disposition of the library? Um, if that question could be answered now, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, we've got uh, Ms. Barry, uh, who has already spoken to this matter. Come on forward. Is there anything new you'd like to add? Uh, Council, um, I wanted to respond to uh, um, Councilwoman Connolly's uh, question about civic groups. I know that the League of Women Voters of Falls Church plans to hold a public forum on the library referendum, uh, plans to issue a, a, a pro and con sheet, plans to have a, a, a town meeting of a sort. As you know, the League is nonpartisan, but I did want to make sure that you knew that there was at least one civic group that was uh, fully engaged in this conversation and, and wanted to, to get total public input. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this matter? Any, any other member of the public? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Why don't we go to council comments? Are there comments from council? Anyone? Is there a motion? We can take a motion and then have comments, or we can have comments then. Mr. Motion. Mayor, I move to adopt TO 16-12. Okay. S second. We, okay, we have a second. Mr. Snyder, second. All right, so let's go on to comments, and does anyone want to comment on the motion or? Mr. Mayor, I withdraw my second. I think Council Member Oliver wanted to second. Why don't you go ahead? I'll second hey. that. Okay. <laughs> so Council uh, Member uh, uh, Oliver on the second. So are there any uh, comments about this? Does anyone wish to speak to this? Okay, we can take a vote if... Uh, <laughs> just, uh, just, Mr. Mayor, very quickly, um, I want to thank the library board for, and the staff for a lot of hard work and this council for a lot of hard work on this. And this is really just the beginning. I look forward to getting citizen input. And I think there's some flexibility built in here so that we absolutely end up with the very, very best project, use of existing uh, facility as well as whatever other options may prove to be the very best for the future of the library in the city. So thank you very much. I think also just for clarification, I imagine most of the folks in the audience understand this, but this is actually not a vote on the um, underlying um, library project. It is to put it out to the public. And so if this is approved tonight, ultimately there'll be a referendum where the citizens, voting citizens of Falls Church will have an opportunity to vote on this matter. Your comments, uh, any other comments from the dais? Ms. Oliver? I just want to echo Mr. Snyder's comments. There's been an awful lot of hard work that has gone into putting this compromise forward, balancing the, the needs of the library and the community in its library against the cost. And I'm glad that we're finally getting to the point that the community gets a chance to finally weigh in on what they want to do. Okay, any other comments? We don't have to have any comments, so uh, all right, do we want to go do a vote then? All right, I think that's where we're headed. Mr. Mayor, can we ask the city attorney to clarify the two-thirds vote requirement, just so I'm clear on that? Yes, there has to be two-thirds of council 
um, voting in favor of the referendum. So um, you will need to, five people will need to vote yes before this can pass. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, just to clarify as well that the motion is for the um, TO 16-12 with the additions that we've talked about tonight. Correct. There are two additions, each of which appears in several places. The first addition being um, in one or more locations and after the word replacing in several places and the other being including an archive heritage center in also in four locations in as we read out earlier. Yes, Vice Mayor Connolly. So as Ms. Barry said, for me this is an easy vote to uh, approve this, but I do think the hard work comes next, and the hard work is explaining everything that we have talked about and understood as we have discussed this in work sessions and council meetings to the community so that they understand what they're voting for and what the implications are and what they're getting out of it. So I think uh, my vote yes tonight is yes, and then there's a lot more work to do. Okay, any other comments? We're ready to take a vote. All right, let's go for it. Ms. Conley. Yes. Mr. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Hardy. Yes. Ms. Oliver. Yes. Mr. Snyder. Yes. Mayor Tarter. Yes. And the motion carries. Okay. We call the next item. Okay. Uh, we call the next item, Madam Clerk. We have TO 16-13 ordinance to amend chapter 16 finance and chapter 40 taxation of the code of the city of Falls Church to allow for additional fees and penalties for delinquent taxes, to allow penalties for bad checks, and to allow for alternate payment arrangements to be made by the treasurer. So Mayor, you have had a work session on this and um, this will be for first reading and we're recommending the first reading schedule for uh, the second reading and holding the public hearing. Treasurer Acosta is here to provide, for the record, a brief synopsis and any updates from the um, briefing that we did. So I'll turn it over okay. to Jody. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Vice Mayor, and City Council. Um, I'm here tonight to present the TO 1613 to you. This um, originally came up during budget season earlier this year because our neighboring jurisdictions already have this additional penalty on personal property tax, the additional 15%, which is applied uh, either at 30 days or 60 days. There's um, an attachment on the back of the ordinance that lists what everyone does. Arlington's is the additional 15% at 60 days. Fairfax is the additional 15% at 30 days, and so on. Um, and uh, if, we, if we adopt this, it would bring us more into alignment with our neighbors regarding our penalty and fee structure. That was the meat of it, the additional 15% penalty. When we decided to look at that, we decided we'd look at um, all of our ordinances regarding uh, penalties and interest and sort of clean up some stuff that needed to be cleaned up. Um, the first part is the bad check fee and the credit card fee, um, which, uh, actually starts, uh, chapter 16 finance starts on line 65. Um, and we're removing some language under the credit cards uh, starting on line 79. Uh, we're actually not allowed to do this anymore by state code. We never did apply the 4% um, late fee for a returned or non-honored non credit card payment. So that's just taking that out of there, cleaning that up. Um, our bank already charges the $50 return check fee, so this is just, again, cleaning this up to change it from uh, $20 to $50. Um, the other part, the next part would be the new section, which is adding uh, the, our ability to apply penalty and interest to all delinquent city accounts, um, you know, other than taxes. We just never had that in the ordinance before, so we were not uh, allowed to add a late penalty on any other city accounts. This gives us the ability to do that. Uh, and that would be a 10% um, late penalty. Uh, the third part is the discretion and the application of payments uh, with a payment plan. Um, 
currently, uh, if someone has a payment plan, they have to do their payment plan and uh, anything has to be applied to their, any payments they make have to be applied to their oldest tax bill or their oldest bill first. So this would give us the discretion of letting them keep current while still paying on that payment plan. Uh, so applying a current payment to the, you know, the current year bill and applying their late payment to the late payment. Um, I mean, ap applying their payment plan payment to their, their uh, delinquent amount. Um, <clears throat> And then the fourth section, which is uh, starts um, in Chapter 40, Taxation, Line 129, it starts with the admissions tax, uh, which is the theater tickets and the uh, bowling, the amusement tax. And currently, we only have one uh, establishment in the city that pays that, and they're never late. So I doubt that we would uh, be applying this to them. Um, but it, it, um, it adds that language in there for the 15% uh, at 60 days. The 15% additional penalty at 60 days. The next section, uh, starting at line 160, when tax is due, section A, line 161, it adds the language in there that uh, after 60 days to add the additional 15% penalty. Uh, and that's on all personal property bills. Section B, starting on line 173, it's the same language, but it's applying to supplemental bills, which we issue throughout the year. Um, and those would be due, you know, generally 30 days after we issue that bill. And so at 60 days delinquent, um, they would get that additional 15% penalty as well. Um, and I think I failed to mention in the beginning the uh, physical impact on this is estimated to be about $30,000 a year. Um, and then we, the last section is section one or line 190, uh, article 11, the tax on meals. Um, the commissioner's office actually uh, assesses the late penalty on meals tax. And due to, you know, the summer schedule and some vacations and stuff, we haven't really had a chance to, the commissioner and I haven't really had a chance to get into this in depth yet. And he's expressed some concern about uh, this. And so, my recommendation would be, you know, leave it in at first reading, but we might be coming back to you with, uh, you know, an amended um, amended language or something after he's had a chance to look at it and study it. Um, I think it's important to leave it in because, um, well, especially for the personal property tax, uh, we're going to mail bills probably around the 1st of September. And so we want this in place by then for the personal property bills. Um, and we would send out a notification flyer, you know, informational flyer in with the bills when we mail them the 1st of September for personal property. <clears throat> so for meals tax, the main thing might be a timing issue to give them time to test it. I'm already testing in Munis uh, our software. The application of the 15%, you know, super penalty is how, how it's referred to commonly. Um, so this would give, if we, if we do come back to you with a, a recommendation, it would just simply be the timing on the meals tax part of it. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Any questions, Mr. Duncan, Ms. Oliver? Or Ms. Oliver, then Mr. Duncan. I just had a question on line 92. Okay. About why you struck the amount of any cost, whichever is greater. I understand the bank is charging $50 now, but they could turn around tomorrow and charge 100 uh, Well, that's true. I think it was just a, a repeat um, of some of the language above. I think that's what we felt, that it was, a, a, it was already covered in the language above. So we struck that. But I'm actually not sure. Do you remember? <laughs> OK. Um, I'll, I'll look into it and I'll get back to you with that. That's what I thought, but I'm, I'm actually not sure. I'll, I'll I, I guess I'm just concerned that if we mention a specific amount that we have some clause in there right. in the same area as the amount that clarifies that it could be greater. Beware of the door or the amount of any cost. Yeah, we could, I mean, we could leave that in there and that would cover us. Yeah, I'm sure over time the amount is going to go up and this will be one of those things you look back and say, you know. Okay. I, I think we uh, do need to look into it and verify that 
um, with the authority we're operating under, whether we still have the authority when we have this additional penalty amount to well, include to go up to additional costs. So we'll we'll verify that. Well, right now I think the state code says you can charge up to fifty dollars. So if the state code were to change and we could charge more, then you know. Well, could we say it's probably would. <laughs> fifty dollars or the maximum permitted by law? Yeah, we could say that, couldn't we? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What else, Mr. Duncan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm sorry. This was discussed at a work session. I think a couple of weeks ago, which I listened to on the phone, and I, because of our um, primitive audio capacities here, I couldn't quite make out what was discussed. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating my repeating things that have already been covered. The fiscal impact uh, issue is is it uh, is it likely that that every year we would expect thirty thousand dollars to come in or is this the sort of thing that the other jurisdictions have experience with uh, and that we would hope that eventually it would get down to zero fiscal impact because we would like everybody to pay on time and we would you know do what we can to inform reach out to uh, alert before the initial deadline uh, I mean is this thirty thousand well uh, I mean, it is intended as a collection tool, right? Uh, that's why the General Assembly initially, you know, passed uh, the bill that would allows localities to do this, um, to increase your collections and get the money in in a more timely manner. Um, and you would think that over time people would, you know, they'd get tired of that 15%, you hit them with it once and they'd never be late again. Um, but you know we have other collection tools that we apply and, and I look back for like the past five years and it's pretty consistent that delinquent amount it's about 10 percent of all the bills that are still delinquent as of you know day 61 over five years and that's and we're applying our other collection tools and that doesn't seem to really move that number very much so okay. I I don't know until until we actually do it it, mm -hmm. it may I mean 15% additional penalty, I mean, that's pretty steep. So it may have the impact of causing people over time to pay quicker because I know that's out there, but I, you know. Okay, well, we'll uh, that's a good answer. I mean, that's a clear answer. Um, my second question is uh, the nature of the, the delinquents. Are these mostly personal accounts? Are these business accounts? Are these, you know, are these people who still live in town and we, you know, deal with them every day or these people who have moved to, you know, Ouagadougou and we have no way to reach them? I mean, what's the well, nature of the delinquents? It's about 10% business accounts. So um, Tom and I were just looking at it today and, you know, going over the list. Uh, you know, it, we knew a lot of people. There were some that had already moved. Um, it's, it's about half and half, I guess, you know. So I don't know the exact number, okay, but I can but get that for you. I, I guess I'm I'm asking that question because I'm I'm trying to get us to the point where uh, obviously everybody pays on time because there's costs associated with you all chasing after people who don't pay on time. Right. I mean, there's time that we're investing in that here um, and staff costs related to that. So ideally, in the perfect world, everyone uh, would pay on time and. Uh, pursuant to that, you know, it would be nice to have the cooperation of the business community, particularly the Chamber of Commerce, uh, to get the message out, you know, hey, your taxes are due, seriously, they really are, and here's an example of how much more you're going to pay if you don't pay up by next Tuesday or whatever the date is. And I would like, I would like at least to see this travel in conjunction with an effort by the Chamber and an awareness by the Chamber that we're doing it, uh, but it sounds like that's going to be tough because you really want it done like by our meeting August the 8th um, so that you can put it in the bills in September and I think the chamber is not due to come talk to us until sometime in early September about just you know their general concerns I had thought this might be an opportunity to talk with them about that but is the is the early September uh, date I mean that is that so important that that we really need to move on this before we go to recess? Well, by law, you have to get the bills out two weeks before the due date. The due date's October 5th. But 
you know, generally we get them out about a month ahead of time. We try to get them out somewhere around Labor Day or right before Labor Day, which gives people, you know, 30 days. Um, and that's, you know, generally accepted throughout, you know, the treasurer world um, and localities throughout Virginia. You know, give them a, you know, three to four weeks uh, before that due date to give them plenty of time in case, you know, if you get mm -hmm. return mail, you have time to get it back out to them, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, so, okay, well, that's, I mean, obviously we don't want to do anything to constrain you sending the bills out. That defeats the whole purpose of the endeavor. So right. I guess my request would be if we could, I know we're heading into the doggest days of the summer, but if we could, uh, you know, establish a connection with the Chamber of Commerce and, you know, they still uh, turn the lights on and have functions in the month of August. Uh, there's a big mixer at uh, Nick's place on Friday night. Uh, you know, there's there are uh, yeah. opportunities for information to get out and maybe that uh, uh, filter its way into the business community during the month of August uh, okay. in a way that might be helpful. And my last question is, uh, is what we're doing here, does it afford you as our treasurer uh, some discretion uh, to Wave, pardon, I don't know what the right word is. I mean, you know, let's say that my business, the mailing that went to my business got delivered to box 736 instead of 776. And, you know, sure, I should have known that it was due, but actually I didn't get my bill because the guy in 736 is gone for six weeks and he didn't think to pull the envelope and put it back in the right box. And so that's my story, and I'm coming to you with that. Do you have any discretion under this to, to basically cut me some slack or, or not? I do. Um, it's spelled out in the state code as to when a treasurer can waive penalty and interest. Um, <clears throat> and there's, you know, a, a set of circumstances, medical uh, issues, you know, a death in the family, um, if through no fault of your own, you made every effort to pay on time, but we received your payment late, such as a postal uh, problem. Um, if you never received the bill, um, not just that you, know, you came in and you said, I didn't receive the bill, but if you know, we can have some pretty good information that there's a problem with your postal delivery, um, or in your case, it got delivered to the wrong post office box, and that, yes, those would be situations where we could waive the penalty. And we do try, uh, you know, to see if they can fit in that, um, in, you know, those parameters to work with people so that it's not such a hardship, you know, when it's truly no fault of their own, so. Okay, thank you. Those are responsive to my questions. So our plan is to do this on August the 8th, is that? What I understand, first reading tonight, second reading and passage. What's, I don't know the exact, okay, yeah, August 8th. That's what the schedule is for. Okay, so between now and then, the things that you said you would be doing in terms of information and communication with the Commission of the Revenue and outreach to the Chamber, it's reasonable to expect that we could knock all those uh, off the list uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and if that's the case, then I, I would support this on first reading. Thank you. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Any other questions? Vice Mayor Connolly? Ms. Acosta, when, uh, when you send out the personal property tax bills, will there be a big, bold notice to people yes. that there's a change? Yes, yes there definitely okay. will be. Uh, there'll be an informational flyer, probably on a bright, you know, neon colored paper to get their attention. Uh, explaining all about, um, you know, the additional 15% penalty and that it's new and, you know, please note, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, press release uh, from the city. Um, I will definitely reach out to the chamber because, uh, you know, I'm a member of the chamber as a treasurer, so I, I can certainly do that. Um, we're going to get it out on social media. So, you know, we're going to make every effort. Uh, we've talked about... Um, doing some uh, phone calling, uh, like a robocall almost, like the day before the due date or the day before that penalty or couple, you know, two or three days before the penalty applies. Uh, I'm looking into the cost for doing that and if I can do it within my budget. And there are several companies out there that do it. We don't have all the phone numbers, but we have a lot of the phone numbers for personal property accounts. Uh, and the commissioner's office is very diligent about collecting those and they are ongoing, you know, they're always collecting those. So we could possibly do something like that as well, which would help, I think. Okay, great. Is there any uh, member of the public that wishes to speak to this matter? 
Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Are there any more questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much for coming out and for your Thanks. input on this. We appreciate it. Sure. Um, so, Madam Clerk, do you want to call? Do we have a motion? We don't have a motion, do we? So, I'll move to grant first reading for TO 16-13, schedule second reading and public hearing for August 8th, 2016, and advertise the same according to law. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, Madam Clerk. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. You call the next item, please. Yes, we have TR 16-37, resolution to allow grant funds previously awarded to the Little City Catch Foundation by resolution 2015-35 to be reallocated for general operational expenses. Ms. Mester. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item is before you as a request from the uh, Catch Foundation. And this is a follow-up to Council's previous action in awarding grants, and there is a letter attached to it from Mr. Keith Thurston, who is present in the audience and can speak to this and answer questions as well, explaining why the intended original purpose to get uh, rental space wasn't being able to come to fruition, but there were definitely still operating needs. And so they are requesting that uh, council approve an amendment to the grant award, allowing them to be reimbursed for our operating related needs, but not consistent with the original application. We have looked at that and because the original grant application was very specific to council's action in order to reimburse them, uh, it would require council action. Staff is responsible is supporting uh, this request and recommends that council approve it. Um, as we note in the staff report, we'll continue to work with the foundation to make sure that as we go forward, since these are reimbursement grants, if an issue surfaces and the original intent can not be achieved, but is still consistent with the grant guidelines and furthering our efforts for arts in the community. And once again, this is the operational money, not the programming money. Um, that we could more proactively address it instead of do, uh, dealing with it after the money's already been expended. So um, I'm available to answer any questions that you have, and as I noted, Mr. Thurston is here as well. Okay, uh, Mr. Thurston, do you have anything to add? Okay, are there any questions or comments from anyone on council? Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak this matter? Seeing none. Matter is closed to the public. Is there a motion? Can I just ask a question? Yes, of course. Sorry. Um, this is for the city attorney. Um, does this create a precedence for our grant process? I'm not sure what kind of precedent you are concerned about. I, I, don't, I don't think it um, creates a harmful precedent I mean, certainly when you all um, approved an award of the money, you can change that award. And um, because the original award, the description of the grant was so clearly about rent, and that's not what it's being spent for, I think staff did not feel comfortable reimbursing those expenses. And so um, the money couldn't be spent unless they come back to you. But so I'm not sure exactly what the concern is about precedent, but because Certainly, you could. It sets a precedent of changing one of these grant awards, but you always would have authority to do that. I guess while I understand the circumstances for this particular situation, I don't want us to get in a position where we evaluate a series of grants that are applications that are before us. We choose the ones that we think are the best, perhaps not awarding others, and then have somebody come back and expect that they can just reclassify it to a use that may not have been perceived as favorably at the time of the application. As I said, right. in the circumstance, I'm not opposed to the change, and I understand what happened, and I would hope that any future grant applications would be broader if that was their intent, but I, I just was concerned about whether we would be opening the door for... I don't, I don't think this would prohibit you from denying a late, somebody else's request, each of these would have to be evaluated based on their own circumstances. And so I think you would not 
be bound by this to approve somebody else's change that you didn't believe was appropriate. Thank you. And also, if I could add, since this is a relatively new program in terms of adding the operational component, this has a, bit, a good lesson learned that we will clarify the guidelines and the instructions when it goes out. But because clearly, if any grant recipient is struggling, they need to come back to staff early on and give us a heads up that this was our intended use. We can't quite do it. And also, as you noted, then we could be more cognizant of how the grant is structured to make sure that the operating costs have a little bit of flexibility because sometimes in things like this situation where there was just nothing within the price point worked out. So good points and something that we'll take as lessons learned um, as the next grant um, application process is active and we have a call for submittals out on the street right now. We'll certainly make it clear before we award grants. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion then? I move to adopt TR 16-37. We have a second. Second. Is there any additional uh, comment? If not, Madam Clerk, will you uh, call the vote, please? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. And the motion carries. You call the next item? Yes, we have TO 16-14, Ordinance to Amend the Code of the City of Falls Church, Chapter 26, Motor Vehicles and Traffic, Article 5, Towing and Immobilization of Vehicles, Section 26-138, Removal of Trespassing Vehicles by Owners of Parking and Other Lot or Building to Permit Initial Hookup and Tow Fees of $135 and Permit an Additional $25 Fee for Nights, Weekends, and Holidays as Required by the Code of Virginia. Ms. Master? Council, um, as you might recall, during the legislative session, we had a towing bill, this particular one, that we worked pretty hard because we were concerned with the state code change to mandate what we actually had to charge versus having an upper limit. And then locally, we could um, set our own rate to compensate actual costs, but not encourage predatory towing. Um, the General Assembly ultimately approved the code um, change to set the maximum rate as well as the night and weekends. And so by c this action would be to make our ordinance align with state code. Uh, the Chief of Police is here this evening and can add any additional comments and is available for questions as well. Chief, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just say that, you know, back I think in 2010 we went through um, a lot of changes with our, our city ordinance in terms of towing. And um, it was like a three-pronged approach. And, and the best offense in our predatory towing watch is Becky Witzman. She works with all of the business is in the tow companies and Alan Freed, who is our investigator for tow um, complaints and the tow advisory board. And so I would dare say back in 2012 was the highest uh, tick in our predatory towing or private toes at 797. Um, as the years went by, 2013, 2013, we were at 503. At 2014, we were at 460. At 2015, we were at 204. And we have a tick up this year. In the last six months, we've had 277. Um, we do, and we have within about the two or three months, we have done some, um, some audits of all the tow companies. Um, they're able to tow in the city, and uh, we continue that. And it, it helps us kind of establish to ensure that they're, they're complying with our ordinance, which makes sure that, one, they're taking pictures of every tow, um, that their signs are in compliance, and they're charging the right fee, and they're there 24-7 for the release of a vehicle. So we, we're doing what we can in terms of the business pr approach, the investigative approach. Uh, so there's a preventative intervention and investigative measure. Um, so as you can see, I, I did just a quick chart that our numbers are going down, but this year we have a little tick up. And a lot of times it's just the personality of maybe a business having issues and having a tow company come in and doing, um, doing a lot of toes and then what happens typically in that instance Becky Witzman does a quick reach out and tries to negotiate um, with the business how we can uh, resolve those issues it's been working for us 
Okay, it sounds like a little bit more than an uptick, though. Yeah. What did you say last year was for the whole year? We had 204 last year. And so halfway through the year, we have more than la more than yes. what we had last year for the whole year. So that right. sounds like we're on track to double last year's numbers. Possibility. Possibility. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hardy? Do we have a hypothesis why? We do. Um, there is a business in particular on Park Avenue that has requested for tows to come in, and one of the uh, tow companies within the city um, has accommodated that. Is this like a big secret? Can we actually just know the name of the business? I, I don't I don't have that. Honestly, I, I did get the statistics, but I didn't get the exact name and the address, but okay. I will get that for you. Anybody else in the room? Do I hear any hands? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I, I, is, I, I don't I'm not faulting you at all, but I mean, if Becky knows, you know, Becky can probably text me right here. She usually watches the meetings. I mean, this is, I mean, come on. It's more than, <laughs> it's on pace to go back to 400, you know, which is where we were. That's, that sounds like a GovOps question to me. I, I, what, what, ha I'm sorry. Well, what, 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 what happens if we don't do, what happens if we don't align our ordinance with the state? I mean, what are they going to do? Put us in jail? Well, I think that um, we would not be able to enforce an ordinance that didn't align with the state code. That'd be, that'd be a good thing. In other words, w <laughs> no, because if the tow company um, what charged, say, the amount said here is $135 for the tow. If the tow company charged somebody $175, we would not be able to enforce our ordinance, which is only allows up to $100. So we wouldn't have any enforcement against the outrageous amount that somebody was charging way above what is currently allowed. The best bet, in other words, to keep fees from getting, from skyrocketing at the whim of the tow companies is to have an ordinance that complies with the state requirements. Is to adopt the state cap. It's not a cap. That's it's correct, but it's no longer a cap. Now it currently says that it will be set at $135. It used to be a cap. It used to be up to um, right. amount, but and we had up so to 100 an hour. So the but. state has capped it at 135 I mean that's that... correct for Northern Virginia jurisdictions for planning district eight. so were, we're supposed to think of this as a good thing because it prevents telling companies from charging in excess of $135 this specific situation came out of a single locality issue with a tow company because the locality would not increase their fees and so for planning district eight which is just Northern Virginia including us this code was changed so it might be something we want to tackle again next General Assembly. But I would concur with the city attorney. We need to align the code because if we don't and there's another violation, we wouldn't be able to enforce. Uh, Ms. Hardy? So it seems reasonable that if rates are going to increase by 35%, that we're going to have more towing in the city beyond 277. Um, so a broader question about predatory towing. And I... Um, I believe most of us are aware that uh, last December, I think our congressman buyer actually um, sponsored legislation that passed in Congress that allows local jurisdictions to regulate towing companies. I wanted to see whether we've looked into what new powers that gives us and um, what actions we can take locally. It's something that we should probably follow up on a little bit more, but I believe that we still are bound by the Dillon rule that governs what we can do, which is we have to comply with state law and there's fairly specific authority under the state law as to what regulations we can have about towing. So a change to the federal law would, we would need to also have a change to the state law to open things up a little more to give us broader authority. Although we do have fairly comprehensive authority in terms of the types of things we can regulate such as the signs and how they, how the tow companies handle their tows, but um, the the way in which we get to regulate those various things is pretty much specified by the state code. So we will Just take that it. as a follow up as part of our legislative process. So a, a follow on request is besides working in the legislative angle is it seems like we've talked several times now about signage around town and making sure that we are both consistent and clear. Um, 
for people parking so that they know when they can get towed or where they could be at risk or where there's free public parking. I wonder whether we could kind of take a more comprehensive look, especially now looking at our tow rates and that pretty severe, I don't even call it uptick, doubling <laughs> what we expect by the end of the year. Um, take a more comprehensive look at signage around town um, and actually do a lot more public outreach to let them know here are the safe places to park, look out for signs that say this, there's new fees that are going to come, you know, a maximum of 135. I think a 35% increase is pretty severe uh, and I think we should probably do our part to let people know. <laughs> this is what, uh, Mr. We certainly can take that to the towing advisory board and the work that um, Ms. Witzman does. I know we've done a lot of work and if the sign is not correct, then they can't legally tow, and that's an investigative angle that we take. There are still some that have not put up the proper signs, and they can't. And the general feedback is it's just confusing, because a lot of times it'll say, this is, you know, this spot is only for this address. But when someone shows up, they're like, well, it's after hours. Like, th these businesses aren't open. And so I think we just need more education or more clarity in what that means for people. Mr. Snyder. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think I've been around this issue how many times with the chief, so my um, empathy, um, I feel your pain on this uh, issue. We all know, though, it's a serious economic development issue and can be a real public relations issue, which I think Councilmember Hardy was alluding to. Um, maybe we ought to take a look again. I mean, we, we really, as a city, offer a lot of free parking, which is pretty unique these days. And but it, I can understand how, too, people are confused, like, where does one business end and another begins? And maybe we should look again at, at making more visible the city-owned spaces and just kind of look at this again and, and um, you know, look at additional parking capability. Um, you know, there are various components to that. Um, but. Um, Maybe there's some value to uh, looking at it again. I, I, um, but, but not to make major structural changes, I hasten to say, because we need our chief. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I, I, I do think that, um, that Council Member Hardy is hitting on something. There just seems to be a lack of sort of basic information, even though we keep trying to put it out there. And it's balancing the rights of the businesses against customers who make a legitimate error, and when they do, they pay an awful lot of money for that. And uh, there's a fair amount of city-owned property around that maybe we can look at that again, how to uh, emphasize that and maybe point people more toward, like, if as long as we have the agreement with uh, Kaiser, um, do even a better job of that, really push it out. He here's, here's a map, like, on our website, here's a map of where the city-owned spaces are and use the media that we have now that we didn't have the first three or four times through this issue. We can certainly do that. And I know sure. EDO and OCOM has been working that hard. We do have the map on the website. I think the public parking spots with our new paint and signage has helped. The issues really are is if you park in this private shopping center, can you go to the library or can you go to another business? And that will just need to be continued education. We do struggle with getting people aware that they can park at George Mason Square and Kaiser after hours with our agreement. EDO just bought some new permanent signs, which we hope will help, but it's going to be an ongoing education, and maybe the towing advisory board can assist, and we'll just keep pushing it. Vice Mayor Message. Conlin, do you have something to ask? I, my, my side comment on this is that we actually need an app that people can carry in their pocket, the full search parking app, and then if they pull into a parking lot oh. that's going to tow them, they get a little flashing light, don't do this. Right. Um, something really immediate like a sign but something people are going to pay attention to because I think that yeah reputation wise we hate to have that go up my other question though Chief Gavin is does the city of Falls Church are there taxes that people pay on these do we does any money come to the city from this hundred and thirty five dollars or is it all going directly to the tow um, can we have a towing tax I don't think we have a towing tax, no, I don't believe. I think $135 goes to um, the tow company. Um, I, I would, you know, I don't like my tax. the tow service is important to public safety. It really is. And it's a tricky balance because they're, you know, sometimes our best friends out there in, in emergencies and or when there's, um, you know, there's private citizen really need. 
Um, but I don't believe that we're getting a tow tax from anything. Um, and the other thing that I would, I would also dare say is that, you know, the city's nightlife is vibrant. And uh, with the addition to the rooftop um, dining on the dogwood and that collaborative parking space is there and some people wanting to continue to keep their space clear at night, it becomes problematic. Um, but uh, I, I like the idea of a, of a parking app. Um, we do try and work with Kaiser uh, often. Um, like I said, I, I think any time when there's a tow um, issue. Becky Witzman is all over it in terms of a pre preventive measure and an intervention um, with, with the businesses. Um, in the audits that we do as a police department in investigating violations is keeping them on their toes, I should say. So um, we are, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of tenants to it. I mean, we look at every, every option in trying to try to manage it. Um, I think most of the uh, most of the toes of late have been along here in Park Avenue, and I would I would dare say that is your vibrant nightlife and people taking chances and thinking like like one of you had said that you know oh that's open at, that's not nobody's there at night I'll take my chance they 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 uh, they park there they have an agreement with the tow company and the tow company comes in and just keeps pulling them out of there um, so. Some of the uh, property management uh, companies will straight up tell Becky Witzman, no, we want them towed out of there. And that's where some of the tows will escalate because the tow company hears that and they're like, they're on it. They'll do it because that's what they've been charged to do. Great. Other questions? So I guess the bottom line of this sounds like that we really have no discretion to alter this legislation or frankly, to not really enact it, to, to not enact it. Is that fair to say? That's, cor that's correct. Okay. So our recourse really lies in Richmond, it sounds like, with respect right. to any dissatisfaction with this ordinance or what it says or an ability to regulate things in a different way. It really is down in Richmond. Is that fair that's to say? That's correct. Okay. I mean, it really is a critical issue. I think for a lot of people, it um, you can hear the frustration I'm sure it has a chilling effect. You know, for people who get towed once, they're going to think twice, probably parking anywhere in Falls Church or, or because they're, they don't know. You know, I'm sure they, a lot of people probably got towed because they didn't know or they thought it was okay. And then the, the next time, they're going to be concerned wherever they might park. So I think it's incumbent upon us to try to really, A, improve signage, B, provide as much public parking as we can. That's safe parking. And I think some of that goes even to our streets. And I've discussed this before is trying to really give us ourselves more on street parking than we have right now um, there are places where our street and, and, and uh, I, I got that look from you but I tell you there are plenty of places where in my opinion we can we can push the um, the area out with sight distance and other things so that we can create some more on street parking in parts of our area particularly Park Avenue that I walk regularly so I'd love to have that conversation offline but I think yeah. it really is important for economic development sure. to try to find some safe places for people to park in our city um, where we can make sure they, they're gonna be comfortable spending time and spend money here. So anyway, thanks for your time on Thank this. You. Unless there's any other questions, why don't we go, Ms. Oliver? I just, while we're just talking about towing, I just have a general comment um, on lines 84 to 94, there's a lot of, there's some language, which is not under, uh, under revision this evening, but it refers to mandatory signs for about towing. Yes. And I know we need to be just very careful about striking a balance on that. You know, we've heard a lot about it would be nice to know where for people to feel more confident about where they can and cannot park. But I just want to make sure that we're not being um, putting too great of a burden on businesses or, uh, say, community associations that would like to post for parking um, and yet don't want to have it be um, you know, a, a six by four sign that is sort of intrusive into the community. Um, I don't know how much flexibility we have in our ordinances, but I just wanted to just say that right. signs are important. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody is doing a lot of towing, I wanna make sure the signs are in compliance, but I do wanna make sure that we're not burdening other organizations that are just using towing intermittently. Correct. We, um, we've worked a lot with uh, private, 
particularly the neighborhoods, to ensure that um, the signage is visible but not littered the neighborhood too much. Now, with the business community, it's been a little more strict because you know people have a tendency to do that 10 minute or five minute drop off and then they go to go somewhere and then come back and then they're towed and they're like I don't see the sign, so that. They have to see the signs coming in, they have to see the signs leaving out, and they have to be a specific si uh, size, height, letters with uh, certain language. Um, we are very strict on the signs. We even sticker and approve them going up. Um, and in this, we would have to uh, affect a change in terms of the signs um, actually coming, going from um, the, the fee, the tow fee would have to actually be, be changed on this. And that is at a cost to typically the tow companies that post the signs. So it's usually not the association or the business, the property management, it's usually the tow, the tow company that pays for those signs. That's so this, this ordinance will require all signs to be changed in the city? Yes. Okay. So, and I, I believe that they can be changed with a sticker on top of the, uh, just the simple fee. So going from 100 to 135. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Any member of the public that wishes to speak to this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Are there any other comments, questions? Just one in closing. Well, lest I be accused of casting a stunt vote, uh, I, I'm not going to support this on first reading. It seems to me like we were doing something that was working very well from 2012 to 2015 by bringing down the number of toes from almost 800 to barely over 200 and and something happened and now things are not working so well and I would I would just like more understanding of you know all of that before we wade into this I don't think this is a particularly time sensitive as far as I know so I'm going to vote no on first reading so Mr. Snyder do you have a comment um, yeah l let me go back to a question that was asked a minute ago do we really have any choice about enacting this well, if you want to have any enforceable towing ordinance, you don't have a choice because right now the state code directs you to have this provision for $135. You don't, if you don't adopt it, you will not have an enforceable ordinance about the price of towing. So then theoretically the prices could go to 200 or 300 or whatever. Correct. The t Right, the tow operators could essentially charge what they wanted and you'd have no ability to enforce the rule. Okay, um, well, Mr. Mayor, if it's appropriate to move this on first reading in view of that legal opinion, and that's the only reason why. Um, could but can, that, could yes. I stop you for real quick, just for a second with a quick question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So when is the deadline by which we have to have this imposed by the state law? Well, it should have been adopted by July 1st. And we're, so we're late, essentially. So do we not have an enforceable ordinance as of today? That's correct. That's correct. Right now, okay. if somebody charged more, um, our ordinance would not, is not in effect in a way that can be enforced. Okay. Okay. So I move on first reading in view of this discussion with legal counsel. And purely for that reason, I move uh, on first reading, um, what is it? TO 16-14 and ask that when this comes back on second reading that we have some, uh, oh yeah, well it's grant first reading, schedule public hearing and second reading for August 8, 2016, advertise the same according to law. But then when it comes back to us, we'd like some, um, at least some initial work on some of these other ideas we have about um, um, better uh, publicizing the existence of legitimate free parking and otherwise uh, taking actions to prevent um, the need for towing consistent with the, the property rights and interests of businesses. Okay, do we have a second? Mr. Mayor, may I ask a question about yes. the motion? Would the mover uh, uh, set second reading for the first meeting in September so that we might uh, have time for the Chamber of Commerce to be involved in this discussion? Um, I would be okay, certainly, with that, but I'm concerned about what the city attorney just said about we don't have an effective towing ordinance. I think that's, that's correct. Um, you would not have an effective ordinance then until September. Um, it also, um, I'm sure you 
want to get the chamber's input, although the way the state code is crafted right now, it would be difficult um, to get input that's going to make a real difference in terms of what you can do because the state code is pretty directive. Yeah, I'm thinking ahead to our advocacy effort in the next General Assembly, I suppose. Okay, thanks for the answer to my question. And that said, we certainly can work with the Chamber in terms of the legislative, their legislative committee and any efforts that Council might direct when we do the legislative process. Right, right. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I might, Council Member Duncan, I, I, I do very much appreciate and want that to occur. So I, I will keep this because I'm concerned about the ordinance expiring. Uh, and taking any more time, um, but I view this as the beginning of a, of a discussion with some initial commentary um, so that we've got at least directionally some things that we're going to be doing and with intensive dialogue with the chamber that can certainly continue after second reading of this particular ordinance, but understanding that I'm totally in sync with your um, desire to work with the chamber. One other question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, as far as we know, uh, are the towing companies now, uh, they've had a month, have they uh, increased uh, their charges above uh, what they had been charging? I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. I think the last audit that we showed in, I think it was probably about eight weeks ago, um, there were some compliance issues with photographs, but um, there was no, I do, do not believe there's any changes in, in fees. Um, but I can double check that along with some of the other statistics and questions you had asked. Okay, thanks. Do we have? Point of process, can I second this motion that was just made? To ask for that, thank you so much. All right, unless there's any other comment, why don't we go ahead and go do a, uh, a vote. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? No. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries five to one. Okay, let's keep on moving. Mayor, can I make a request or comment? Yes, of course. Um, so before we move off this towing topic, which is popular tonight, um, I think all of us reluctantly voted for this, or those of us that did. Um, while I guess towing companies or businesses have to change their signage, I don't know whether it'll just be stickers, can we take the opportunity to actually just figure out whether the signs are appropriate the way they are or an opportunity to change given the feedback we've heard from residents that sometimes things are not clear is this a good time to also make that change or do we not have the ability to do it without the general assembly giving us that power the ordinance that the city has adopted has specifically called out the signs this was a lot of work with the towing company and with the businesses to make them black and white and red and really visible and so in order to do that you would need to change the ordinance and I would propose that we need to do a much more extensive discussion if we we're going to change it because it was about a year's worth of effort to get to where we were to standardize and have consistent language that did comply with the state code but allowed it to tailor as I recall, the signs were probably the major issue with the tow companies because the signs are purchased by the tow company, um, not the property manager. And um, it was a bigger deal for the neighborhood associations. Um, and it almost out, I mean, the expense was too much for some of the tow companies to even do business in the associations because they don't tow that much into the neighborhoods. But it, in the property management business areas, um, there were a lot of signs that had to be redone. Uh, but there was a lot of language in and around the signs, and uh, they're, they're very costly. I don't remember the exact cost at this moment. So I'm hearing that, yes, the city has the ability to change the requirements of the signs. It's not something that the state has to give us the ability to do, but we did recently undertake this effort a couple of years ago. Is that right? 2010. We, we did that. We did an extensive uh, sign uh, samples. Um, to, to change the fee, it would be as simple a matter of us doing it, them doing it by sticker and us approving it. We had also a city sticker that we approved it on the back that every sign had to be brought in here and approved by our uh, towing inspector. Maybe something we can take offline, but um, it seems like, again, given the numbers are pretty staggering increases, it might be worth revisiting whether 
the signage is appropriate, whether it's the language and consistency or the locations of the signs. I don't know what it is that's, I think we continue to get, you know, complaints and concerns about this. And um, we can certainly bring some more data back on where the uh, specific increases are and also circle back with our inspector and Becky um, from economic development, sort of where people have complied with the signs and where it's working or not. I, I suspect it's not the physical sign that's the issue, but either where it's located um, and some people haven't done the new sign because uh, they didn't want to pay for the towing company to do it and do the agreement, so then they're not enforceable. So we'll need to do a little bit more and report back to you, but I, I'm not sure that it's actually the physical sign that's the issue. It's typically the business practice. If a new business goes into a location and then hires a tow firm within the city or outside the city and wants a certain practice, and that's sometimes where we get our peaks, um, they'll say or they want to know zero, zero tolerance in terms of parking off hours or whatever in their lot. That's when um, the tow company goes in and does a lot of towing. And I th Thank you. Maybe. Let's see, what might not be bad. I'm sorry, did you have something else? Oh, I was going to suggest that this could be a future Economic Development Committee topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would actually be interesting to know the areas, like the whatever block of whatever street or where the problem areas are, and then if we could try to identify some alternatives that we could promote so that this just doesn't happen. For example, if it's near the Kaiser lot, maybe better signage for the Kaiser parking area might help alleviate this problem because it's really not in anybody's best interest well, maybe the business owner or the tow company, but it's, in, it's probably not in most of our best interest to have this go on with any regularity. So okay. maybe we could try to figure out a, a, some alternative solutions to this. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Let's move on to the next item, which I think is the consent items. That would be correct. You have um, one um, contract item on consent and then one appointment, I believe. For the contract one, this is for our dance hobby classes with um, Everybody Dance Company. And this is coming back to you simply because the success of the program has bringing the dollar amount over the $100,000 threshold per council policy. It's not, cannot be authorized by the city manager, but rather council. So we recommend approving um, and authorizing the city manager to renew this contract and the details of the dollar amounts and our ongoing um, work with this uh, vendor is described in the staff report. Okay. Um, all right, do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, uh, b before there's a motion, question. Is this the kind of cost that's reimbursed by user fees? Yes, it's 100% reimbursed by user fees, and the city actually um, nets the uh, revenue above that. So all our costs are um, covered by this. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question, Mr. Mayor? Of course. Uh, in this uh, instance, in instances like this, uh, when the city contracts with someone, do we run some sort of a check against their uh, tax uh, paying status and I'm in, in line with what we were talking about earlier tonight. Is that is that just a matter of course thing that we do? Yes, part of our procurement, we do have requirements for business licenses and any other requirements to comply. But doing business in the city, it would depend on whether they have a headquarters here or not, may alter their exact requirements, but that is part of our procurement process. Okay, so money from us doesn't go out until uh, money that's due from any business comes to us. Correct. Okay, thanks. All right, do we have a motion? Uh, I move to authorize the city manager on behalf of the city to renew a contract for dance hobby class services with Everybody Dance LLC annually for three additional one-year terms and an amount up to $80,000 annually, subject to annual appropriation of funds by city council in the budget. Okay. Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Connolly. I think Mr. Duncan read 80,000, but it should be 90,000. I'm sorry, 90,000. My bad. Can I ask a point of process? Do we just move the entire consent agenda? Or do we have to move each item on it? I think generally you do do the full consent agenda and there is appointments 
And with Mr. Z not pre present, if you want the city clerk maybe to read that out. Uh, yeah, or okay. Ms. So Conley. someone can do it. Let's just <laughs> make this quick. I, this, I move to appoint the recommended slate of candidates, and that is Nicole Newman to serve on the Human Services Advisory Council. Okay, so we have two motions. Um, what, since we're we don't on, have any seconds yet. I know, though. so we're going to get we're going to get seconds. So why don't we just do these individually, even though we could have done them together? Since we're going to already... remove them from consent. Then what's that? We'll remove them from consent and just okay, that's fine. Well, I tell you, we've already got motions on the table. We don't have seconds, but we do have two separate motions, which we can three, just three, three, because I moved the consent agenda. Oh, you did. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. <laughs> so you moved the consent agenda. Did anyone second that? No. Could someone second, second. get that? All right, second. Okay. Why don't you have people withdraw their other motions? I'll withdraw my motion. And I mine. Okay. Okay, so Ms. Oliver removed the consent agenda, and did we have a second? Because Mr. I Snyder. It. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. So, um, any business not on the agenda? Just a note that the Economic Development Committee meeting is scheduled for, rescheduled for Thursday, August the 11th. Nine o'clock. 9.15. 9.15, actually. Can you notice it for 9.15? I did. I did, okay. <laughs> I thought it said nine. Okay, thanks. Okay, what else do we have, Vice Mayor uh, Conley? In light of the grand opening of Harris Teeter on Wednesday, will the mayor's meeting be later? It is. I think it's noticed for 8.30, is it not? I still left it noticed as 8, and then I'm just going to be there and tell people you're at Harris Teeter for part of the meeting, and then you'll, you'll come along when you're ready. I think it'll We're be more covered. like 8.30. I think, the, uh, from what I understand, the grand opening will be pretty short and sweet, and so I don't think it's going to take too long unless everybody wants to go in there and shop, um, which probably people do. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think it's going to be a fairly short grand opening. I suspect we'll be out of there in 15 or 20 minutes, but the idea is to have the meeting shortly thereafter. That's okay with everybody. So the Harris Teeter event doesn't have to be separately noticed as a gathering of officials. I did it anyway. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so is there any other business not on the agenda? Council member comments? Um, we do have the minutes from June 13th. Are there any corrections to those minutes, changes? Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the minutes of June 13, 2016. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Any comments, corrections? If not, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Is there anything else to be talking about tonight? Move to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Good evening.